the car went straight as an arrow, not for once deviating from the white line in the middle of the road that unwound, kissing our left front tyre. 50 years ago, Jack Kerouac wrote a book called On The Road. The book is all about this bloke, Jack Kerouac, and his crazy carjacking con man mate, Neil Cassidy driving across America and getting into adventures and doing stuff that I know a bit about, like drugs and sex and living in the moment. Good stuff like that. I read it when I was 19. I was dead excited by the sort of the sense of um, magic in it and the sense of possibility. So in homage to a book about two slacker friends cruising around, I'm doing the same with my best pal and comedy soulmate, Matt Morgan. There he is, look at his little face. You know, we've had a few of married couple style arguments. Matt was driving along, all confident with his arm out the bloody window. You fool. Driving on the handbrake on. How long have you driven? You don't understand the road. I am the road! I live the road! Me and Matt are going to drive coast to coast from Atlantic to Pacific Ocean. So we got the book, a pickup truck and three weeks for as many Kerouac encounters as we can pack in. Do you want a lift? See you, mate. If Jack Kerouac was alive, right, and we had to interview him, he'd go, You're missing the point of the book! You completely missed the point of the book, you bastard, you blonde-haired assholes! I'm going to start my Kerouac journey here in Lowell, Massachusetts, Jack's childhood home. This feels like, and indeed is, small town America. I can imagine why you'd have a wanderlust if you lived here. It's just very sort of quiet, isn't it? Quaint and dull. Yeah, that's right. I think it's small in like, the mentality of it. I think people round here in the conservative 50s would have been right browned off with some of Kerouac's explosive sex and drug fueled scribblings. But these days, the people of Lowell are quite proud of their most famous son. A few cars zipped by. A hot rod kid came by with his scar flying. Down at a local cafe as part of On The Road's 50th birthday party celebration, fans are taking turns to read the whole book cover to cover in a 12-hour marathon session. That's right, man. Now you're talking. Matt and I have been asked to do a reading and we arrived just in time for a really nice saucy bit. Six. Sex was the one and only important and holy thing in life. She sat there on the edge of the couch with her hands hanging in her lap and her smoky blue country eyes fixed in a wide stare. Even though it was just a little calf, Matt got all stage frightened and wore makeup. Finally, a car stopped at the empty filling station. The man and the two women in it went, wanted to study a map. I stepped right up and gestured them rain. They consulted. I look like a maniac, of course, with my hair all wet, my shoes sopping. So, folding back my comfortable home sheets for the last time one morning, I left with my canvas bag in which a few fundamental things were packed and took off for the Pacific Ocean with $50 in my pocket. As well as being a spiritual quest, Kerouac's book is full of sex and drugs, stuff that would have made his neighbours feel all nervous and bilious. So what made Jack Kerouac such a maverick thinker? I'm here to chat to his brother-in-law, John Sampras. Not Pete Sampras, the tennis player, which is what my silly brain kept making me think. <laughs> what do you know about him? before he was a tennis player? <laughs> he won Wimbledon, he has a lot of body hair, he has tight, curly hair. <laughs> So, right, this is what I want to get out of old uh, John Sampas. One, signed racket. <laughs> <laughs> and if I imply that I think he's a tennis player. I'll butt in. Butt right in. 
John and Russell. Oh, nice to meet you, Russell. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> the situation was exacerbated by an unnecessarily large giant tennis ball just lying about in his house. To have balls this big, That's what right. a game they must have played. Yeah, exactly. Um, John, he were a bit um, obsessed with this freedom, wasn't he, and celebration of life and living in the Absolutely. moment. What do you think about all that? Well, I can understand it because I relate to it. I grew up in a small town. There's something a little bit frightening about embracing the unknown. I don't think the young people feel that way. I'm fucking young. You think so? I hope so, mate, because what else have I got? Um, John, I'm interested in how you related to women, you know. What the hell is this? What do you mean, love list? Well, look at it. Love list. ED, 100, New York, New Jersey, Detroit, Ontario. Jeannie, 25, Washington. Is this a list of scores? Yes. What is the score out of? Cos, like, look, she gets 20, she gets 100. Well, what the it? hell was what she was doing? That was his first wife, Edie. Edie? Edie Parker. She's getting 100 points, Edie Parker. 100 points, 100 lays. Are you thinking this is times? Oh, this is approximate, I, I would imagine. 100 lays. So it's not a point system for no. she did bummy, no, 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 full no, no. marks. No. Oh, it's a Spanish communism. Spanish communism. communism. <laughs> Strange woman. He's having sex with abstract concepts. No, Spanish, Democracy. Yeah. That was a go god. That was a hell of a night. It was very fair. <laughs> we decided. John Sampas. What a <laughs> night that was. Three hundred. Kiss the cuddle. Thanks very much. You're welcome. I'm going to come back at the end of it with a lovely list of women's names, <laughs> all scored in. <laughs> all right. Let's try to compile your list. Because <laughs> you wouldn't know the names of some of the girls. You'd have to just put that bird at the bus stop and stuff. Yeah. Woman with no toe and <laughs> hairy shins. <laughs> Kerouac's youthful wanderlust took him away from here. For years he roamed the country like an oboe, often penniless and starving. But in the end, he never escaped Lowell. We're hitching a lift in a classic Hudson car, like the one featured in On the Road. What the hell is that? Kerouac's gravies littered with bottles of ketchup and crackers. Ritz crackers. Rice Krispie treats. Peanut butter and milk chug. A fat man's picnic. <laughs> Is there anything Catholic you want to do while I do something secular? Well, then you might want to cross yourself. I'll cross myself then. And I might want to do my world famous moonwalk. <laughs> <laughs> Where's his body though, laying? Because Probably I think you're on it. He you just danced on his grave. Oh and no. You can't be serious. No, I can't be serious. I am the living embodiment of John McEnroe's perpetual to courtside <laughs> lament. I cannot be serious. Gracious. Actually, I want that. You could have that. Do you know, stealing from a grave. It even is though it's weird. grave robbing, in a way. I think Kerouac would have nicked it. That is stealing something. Well, you haven't bought it, have you? And that's clearly not a shop. Yeah, but think about the book, right? They like nicking things. Not from graves. We'll read a passage of this, this can be our tribute, even though the tribute of being in the moment is very much the... Uh, spirit. You know, what he would have wanted. wanted. Yeah, I've heard it. Right, hold on, let's let destiny decide. Okay. Finally, I took a walk alone to the levee. I wanted to sit on the muddy bank and dig the Mississippi River. And the Montana log rolls by in the big black river of the night. It ain't nothing but bureaucracy and unions, especially unions. But dark laughter would come again. Dark laughter would come again. And here we bloody well are. It's time for us yeah. to hit the road like an angry pope. Lol, you couldn't hold Kerouac, and you certainly can't hold me. And settle down. Live a simple life in a quiet town. Steady as she goes. Steady as she goes. Just like Jack, we're feeling the magnetic pull of New York City. Now, somewhere out here, Kerouac reckoned he'd uncover a kind of spiritual enlightenment, or as he called it, it. 
it could be boiled down to find the truth within yourself is it's about being in the moment that you can't go oh i went on this journey once and i found inner peace which was hilarious once that bloke he went around and goes all right mate um yeah, i've got secrets of inner peace actually i was that happy he goes yeah hold on i've gone written down on a bit of paper hold on and then i can hear him looking around and go fuck i've lost it Kerouac's favourite companion on the road was his best mate, the rebellious, self-confessed, fastest man alive, Neil Cassidy, who was like a brother to him. I believe it was Plato that said, there's no friendship more beautiful than that between two men. Me and Matt's relationship's a bit more complicated. It's not a love-hate relationship. It's a like-hate relationship. <laughs> when I first met him, I didn't really like him. <laughs> I thought he was... A bit of a show off. My relationship with Matt is kind of like I have this sort of, it's like a coupling, um, it's unconsummated. Yeah, I know what you mean. Quite rightly unconsummated. Kerouac was the shire of the two men and he was bewitched by the mercurial Cassidy. When Kerouac wrote on the road, he thinly disguised Cassidy by calling him Dean Moriarty, the hero of the book. In the book, you know, Jack Kerr talks about women a lot, but really his main focus of his love is Neil Cassidy. What are you saying? Matt is... I mean, he adores me. <laughs> it's very sweet. He's I mean, he... basically come on this trip just to ogle me, <laughs> watch my behind wiggle across the states. <laughs> he's funny, and sensing the humour in everything, I think he's powerful, because I think ultimately it's about death. I think it's about the acknowledgement that nothing matters, that it's stupid. <laughs> New York, a city that had a defining effect on Jack Kerouac, where he became hooked on the soundtrack of his era. Kerouac said he wanted to write like jazz musicians played, with a sense of spontaneous and free-flowing expression. And here in New York, Matt and I have to perform our own unhinged, unrehearsed, babbling stream of consciousness, our weekly Radio 2 show. Digital. BBC Radio 2. Russell Brand. You're listening to Russell Brand live on Radio 2 from New York. One day, ages ago, a man wrote this novel, right, about searching for spiritual freedom uh, in the great wide open landscapes of America. Fifty years later, I have to share a room with Matt Morgan. <laughs> so if you are a writer, Please think about the consequences of your work. I have to watch him sleeping in his little tiny white toddler's pants. They're not toddler pants, they're my pants. They're not, I've not got them off of a toddler. I don't know how that exchange would ever take place. <laughs> I get them directly from a shop. I'll give you all this ice cream. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's no way that you could do that without it. Even if it was, I'm simply want the pants. There's no court in the land will go, well, quite clearly, he just wanted the pants. They, it would just look bad. Fiercely. Me and Matt are staying at the famous Chelsea Hotel. We have been sleeping together in the same bedroom, like a latter-day sort of punk step to and son. Yeah, it's not like Morecambe and Wise, because Morecambe and Wise get on. Quite frankly, it's a dump. Went to see Jack Kerouac's grave, right? And on Jack Kerouac's grave, peanut butter, a Rice Krispie Square, and some rich crackers, other crackers are available. Peanut butter, you don't need that in the afterlife. I mean, you can't turn up at the gates of heaven to St Peter and say, well, you know, if this might help sway you. <laughs> Crunchy or smooth, let me in. Crunchy or smooth. I'm here looking for the spirit of Kerouac's America. Jack loved the excitement and madness of 50s New York. The closest I can get to that vibe these days is here in Greenwich Village, where the Howl Festival is celebrating the writers and poets of Kerouac's beat generation. I'm going right, straight, the black tar roads that curve among the mournful rivers like Susquehanna, more mambo-jambo, 
I'm meant to be reading one of Kerouac's poems to this lot of crazy, lovable beatnik chaps, but they take their poetry dead seriously in these parts, and I'm a bit worried that I'm going to have to play it straight. No, this is a small gig. You've got a clear thing to do. Read that poem. I've got to read this fucking poem, Barry Blues. When I do the fucking poem, I'll laugh. And I see shadows dancing in a doom in love, holding tight the lovely asses of the little girls. How am I going to get through that on stage? I reckon what should happen is you'll get to asses, right? Yeah. And you'll think, I'm doing it, I'm doing the rubric and I'm not laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Also, to make matters worse, I'll be backed by one-man jazz band, David Amram. Amram was a good mate of Kerouac's, and in a moment of 50s madness, he and Jack invented the balmy hybrid jazz poetry. In the interest of good taste, Bob Holman Remity at Bowery Poetry Club, Improvisatory good times, don't you see? Jazz is about setting the crooked path straight, as they say in the Bible. Do you reckon he'd done that with his writing, Kerouac? Every second. Do you reckon? He was spontaneous, mm. but he came from a disciplined background, so he combined formality and spontaneity. <laughs> reading a poem tonight. How am I going to capture the spirit of things? I'm scared. You just do whatever's in your heart and I'll be listening like a hawk and I'll follow you and it'll be perfect. Amram, hawks are a deaf. Oh, I'm as angry America. as a fox. I'm as stubborn as a bucket. Yell, I guess. Across the night. Eastward, over the plains, we <laughs> Thank you. I ain't never been on stage before with all you musicians. Well, I'll read a poem. What are your... Do some racket in the background. <laughs> Alas, I'm not a drug addict anymore, so this is uh, strikingly real. Uh, were I still able... <laughs> I'm not observing this through a veil of opiates. <laughs> so, uh, five years, one day at a time, etc. <laughs> Christ. I'll, I'll just be shorter. <laughs> Bowery Blues by Jack Kerouac. For no church told me, no guru holds me, no advice, just stone of New York. And on the cafeteria we hear the saxophone. And I see shadows dancing into doom in love holding tight the lovely asses of the little girls in love with sex, showing themselves in white undergarments at elevated windows, hoping for the worst. Stop. Kerouac Jack. On the Road made Kerouac famous, but it was seven agonising years after he wrote it before it was published. I know how I felt when I finally achieved notoriety. Hello, Joyce Johnson. But unlike me, Kerouac was a shy sort of a bloke, and I wonder how he coped with it. Joyce Johnson was his girlfriend at the time and was with him at the very moment he read the first review. We've got that newspaper. Oh, fantastic. We've got it, like, yeah. So where is it? Can you... Uh, aha! There aha! It there it is. Books of the Books Times. Books of the Times, yeah. On the Road is the most beautifully executed, the clearest and the most important utterance yet made by the generation Kerouac himself year named years ago as Beat. On the Road is a major novel. Good review, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very In, good as review. As well as being glowing, it's yeah. accurate. So you sat with him when the first time that he saw that. He saw first... that. His response was peculiarly flat. Flat? It was, it's good, isn't it? Right. After that review, he was suddenly overnight. Everyone wanted to know about him. And, and, and the idea of the beat generation got spread far and wide. Everybody responded to this sort of, uh, you know, uh, youth quake. 
everything for Kick's idea. So they got that bit. They what got didn't that they bit. get? They didn't get the bit that the book was had a whole sort of spiritual dimension. You know, Jack's real intention behind the novel a rather got lost. Beautiful and respectful exactly. idea. Yeah. Was lost because oh my god, everyone's smoking joints exactly. and having it off. Exactly. You know, the Jack figure mm -hmm. on the road. He was actually on a quest for God. Everything is fine. God exists. We know time. God exists without qualms. As we roll along this way, I'm positive beyond doubt that everything will be taken care of for us. That even you, as you drive, fearful of the wheel, the thing will go along of itself, and you won't go off the road, and I can sleep. I wonder if the spirit of On the Road can ever be recaptured in a movement, a rebellious revolutionary movement, that will return people to those kind of values. Do you think that's what people want? Do you think it's possible? Do you think it's people, too far? Younger people always ask me that, and I would like to think that that could happen, but people will have to do that on their own terms. Do you know what it's making me feel uncynical? That's what it's making me feel. It's making me feel I'm fucking going to do something. It makes me more cynical, because I just think... Don't be cynical. That's another part of our relationship. I'm an optimist, and I? I think we can change the world. I totally believe in revolution. I think you're deluded. I believe no. that, um, that we could found a new society founded upon spiritual principle. Right here, all this, you'd have to change all this. But this happened, and this was nothing. So it's happened once already. If you'd lived in 1940, you would have said it's impossible for black people ever to have emancipation, wouldn't you? Because it was impossible, but it happened. If everyone realised there was a possibility for oneness, then you wouldn't need anything. You've got to break them out of that. They've got to think, what? So I lose my telly, I lose my safety, I lose my health insurance, I lose the fact that I've got um, my kids at school around the corner. All these things, yeah. you're, you're asking to risk all the safety yeah. all for a things, spiritual change. All those things that aren't making that you happy need. are going. I'd love for you to do this. I'd love to see you. Risk all that stuff that you've carved out. Yeah. Right? Because none of it means anything and none of it's no, making me happy. No, I know it doesn't. And I know you're not happy. No, no, I'm not that happy. What do you want to be? Paul, you know, as I say, someone that's brilliantly successful, like Paul Newman, he has his own mayonnaise. Paul has got a vinaigrette, which is delicious. It's delicious. It's a delicious vinaigrette. <laughs> no one's attacking a vinaigrette. But I'm just saying that we could do something better even than that vinaigrette. <laughs> I don't you know. Mean, I'll tell you what just you Just the mean. relish right. or something. Joyce Johnson, Kerouac's ex, believes that a lot of people got her fellow wrong, and I'm with her on that. Kerouac's book is about much more than people getting bombed on drugs and sleeping with whoever they want, although they are good bits. Really, it was a book about questing after spiritual spirituality. It was quite a traditional book, and it was sort of condemned as being a very modern, anti-establishment piece of literature. After that, it became viewed as like, oh, wow, it's like a, a manual for the beat generation, a counter-cultural guide. So we've left the eastern seaboard behind and we're heading into the vast body of America. There's 3,000 miles of road in front of us and God knows what sort of extraordinary, life-changing revelations we'll find. Jesus is real. So the same way that says, buy McDonald's. Jesus is real. The commodification of everything. If you died today, where would you spend eternity? I don't fucking know. That's a pretty powerful question to ask that's at the start sort of, of the road. going to make someone crash as well. <laughs> if you died today. <laughs> Time now to pay respects to our beloved sacred parchment. The original manuscript of Kerouac's novel has been on the road itself, touring the country. Kerouac spent seven years mulling over this book, but he bashed it out in a three-week non-stop splurge of creativity fueled by caffeine on this single enormous roll of paper. Look, it's like a road. Hey. It's a big, long road. The scroll is 120 feet long. We have 36 feet on exhibit. 
It's very, very thin tracing paper. And what we wanted to show is at the very end, where the dog ate the scroll, and he was showing the scroll to his friends and left it on the table, and the dog started chewing the back of the scroll. Do you think a dog really ate it, or he was meant to have finished it? <laughs> he hadn't done. So it was, oh, dog ate the scroll. That's an excuse. Wouldn't it be bad if, like, I'd really convinced you to let me touch it? <laughs> I begged you on that, and you went, all right, I will let you. And then it got all tangled up on us, and we like, ended up all wrapped up like mummies in it, <laughs> and everyone was crying. I think there'd take... be a lot of unhappy people. Whilst the scroll is on display to the public, it's actually the private property of Jim Ursi, the multi-millionaire eccentric owner of the Indianapolis Colts, the reigning Super Bowl champions. It cost Tycoon Jim a ludicrous 2.4 million dollarinos. 65, 66, hut, hut, hut. I don't like to do anything that makes you sweat if you don't come at the end of it. Yeah. Where, where is Jim? He is Should I wait way? Yeah, I, I was just say wait here and just wait here. Yeah, we'll be here and he'll be here. More We've been asked to wait in the office Scott, of Super Bowl you. winning Excuse head coach Tony Dungy. They need to pick up the phone. Yeah. Find the number for tactics. Tactics. <laughs> <laughs> and give him some new tactics. Walston. Tell Walston. Loudspeaker. Hello, Walston. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. This is Tony Dungy. I'm with you. Gotta make some changes. Now, from now on, all linebackers are gonna be wearing ballet shoes. It's gonna make them nimble on their feet. They're gonna be super fast. <laughs> are you with me, Walston? Because if you're not with me, you're against me. Oh, I'm with you. Where is John Cleese? Uh oh. Where is John Cleese? Jim. I heard he might be here. <laughs> Jim, what a joy to meet you. You're obviously uh, rich and successful, an example of the American dream. Do you not think that it's bizarre that that scroll is owned by you, a dead, rich, powerful man, when a lot of it's about, you know, the, the term beat itself is about people that are down and out and that? Not really, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm a peasant by nature. I believe no one has it made, and, and I believe that we're all on spiritual ground equally. You know, no more, no less. But you're a, a man in, with uh, considerable power. You sort of own a football team, incredible wealth and influence, and also you have that kind of awareness. I wouldn't expect, you know, through my own prejudicial views, to meet a man in your position and for you to talk like that about spirituality. When you're put in a position, you know, where, where you have everything, it's awfully hard to be happy if you're not spiritual because you realize everything is really nothing. We live these mundane lives and, and life kind of, you know, turns along, but we're looking for the magic. You know, to me on the road, it's just that tale that, that will always be there of youth and pursuing, you know, the, the passions of your life. So, okay, look, how come you bought that scroll in? Basically, I, I always say the scroll found me. And it's just like when I got the scroll, who is this guy? What's he going to do? Is he going to lock it away? You know, but instead, you know, I've spent a lot of money uh, putting it on the road, building, you know, a case for it, having people care for it, and get it all around the world. You know, but eventually it'll be buried somewhere, and then there'll be clues sent around. You're going to do an Easter egg hunt with so it? So possibly so, yeah. It would have to have some rules tied to it where the person could only keep it for a year and then they would have to do something with it that would be... You're really thinking you know, about doing that Easter definitely. egg hunt, aren't you? Definitely. I mean, definitely. You're an amazing man. It's very interesting to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks well, thanks much. so much. Cheers. The walls. <laughs> Imagine that for a kickoff. <laughs> All right, man. You said all right to that. I'll let them have that. They won't need that. Look at that open place. That's making the place look untidy. <laughs> oh, back, mate. It's Myra, Jim said I was allowed to have this, so uh, <laughs> where are the cheerleaders kept? They're probably hungry. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to get that scroll and bury it somewhere and then just have a big Easter egg hunt for a scroll and whoever finds it can have it. What if no one finds it? That's irresponsible. God bless you, Jack Kerouac. It's no use to them, they're dead and gone. It's what Kerouac would have wanted. Our next stop is Kansas City, but first our route takes us over America's legendary Mississippi River, M-I-S-S-I-S-I-S-I-P-P-I. -S 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 
Here we are, in a Huckleberry Finn country. Will you do your wee? Well, I will, I'll try. Nervously and tentatively, the full maturation begins. Those are grasshopper things. Big grasshoppers like this. It's actually quite remarkable to see him in his natural environment like this. Uh, Problems in a good shape. What? Do we? No. There's all grasshoppers in there. Because of grasshoppers. Oh, Jesus. Look at him, he's like Goldilocks. We're nearly halfway through our journey, so there's a little bit of time for skylarking and hijinks in Kansas City. Turning to our road trip Bible for inspiration, words from Dean Moriarty show us the way. We bounced in our seats and dig her, yelled Dean, pointing at another woman. Oh, I love, love, love women. I think women are wonderful. Great beads of sweat fell from his forehead from pure excitement and exhaustion. Russell's um, desire for women and that, you know, the, the way Dean sort of goes, oh, women, women, I love women, you know, he says, oh, Russell says that. Yeah, he's similar to Dean in that way. You won't, I don't think, one day, Kat, when you're no longer young and beautiful, look back at your life and say, thank I God I didn't kiss that mysterious Englishman. My mum is a plastic surgeon, so I'll oh, always really? be young and beautiful. I'm consumed by desire. Such a furious passion that I think it will destroy me. Are you going to do some comedy though? Yeah, I'll get Okay, tell me a joke. Well, I'm sort of busy now doing this. <laughs> the male libido is like being chained to a madman. Look around at the world, it seems tedious. <laughs> tedious. I'm not a host. Why? Look at I've been left alone. <laughs> Just text in England. I like the simple life. So I do worry about him. I've suggested some sort of chemical castration. Kerouac and um, Neil, they thought they had to have a wife, kids and family home, right? Because that's what the social pressure on them was but then they knew that they couldn't do that. I think you probably struggle to stay with the woman. Do you know what I mean? In a family setup, if you don't mind me saying that. I think that I'm not gonna be happy until I still go, right, stop trying to be really famous. Go get out one, I sort of feel like I need to get to a point where I dedicate my life to something that I know is truthful. When your rooster crows at the break of dawn Look out your window and I'll be gone You're the reason I'm traveling on But don't think twice, it's all right We're clearing right off out of Kansas and heading for Denver Entering the infamous west of America Kerouac didn't just hang around with New York beat poets, he set out to see the whole of the country and got a kick out of meeting the old cowboy characters of the West. And by God, the first cowboy I saw walking along the bleak walls of the wholesale meat warehouses with a great big 10-gallon hat on and Texas boots looking like any beat character of the brick wall dawn of the East except for the get-up. I heard a great laugh the greatest laugh in the world, and here came the rawhide old timer and Nebraska farmer. I said to myself, wham, listen to that man laugh. That's the West. It's time to cowboy up. Hi, Jim Gray. Jim, lovely to meet you. This is Matt Morgan. Hi, Jim. Hi, Matt. In the book, On the Road, the Jack Carrick book, they're always looking for the real America and trying to find God in that landscape. There is a sense of heaven. There's a sense of this is, this is it. Do you think that's why people then that live out east are compelled to come west? When you get out here in the horizons, you almost feel like you're going to fall off, you know, out into that nothingness. It's like it, it just goes on and on, and, and that can be frightening to some people. Hello. Hey, how's it going? 
Good. Look at really him. Great. Johnny Bingo. Johnny Bingo? Yeah. I'm, I'm Russell. Come a little closer. Am I going to put that on my fucking head? It's all wet. It's not wet on the inside. It is. It's disgusting. It wasn't wet, was it? It's not that. It's not. Smell my head. Oh! <laughs> Christ, what's wrong with you? Yeah, that's pretty much that. Yeah, don't try and get the price up now. I know what you're doing. You just dragged it out of your attic, sprayed it down with water, and then tried to vlog it. We're not tourists, we're genuine cowboys. I can tell by your outfit you're a real cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can borrow it, isn't it? Have you ever heard of the book by Jack Kerouac called On the Road? Yeah, he was uh, way ahead of his time. Where'd a couple of guys like us pick up women in this crazy two-horse town? You know, I've been here ten years and I still can't tell you. <laughs> Join the crowd. That's pretty amazing. That's the most amazing vista we've come across, isn't it? Definitely. The rooftop of America, that's what they call that bit, eh? I think I need another wee. I could try and do one. Out the window. Oh, Jesus Christ. That ain't gonna work. I think I can do it. That's gonna go down the car. Russell, don't fall out. Ah, ah! What? What if I did it out of that? No, don't go out there, honestly. Russell, no! You fucking idiot. I'm out here, Matt. It's the world of wonder. Right, hold on to the car inside and do a piss on the truck, you bloody idiot. Disgusting looking stuff. This is Denver. Part of On the Road was set here, and it's the hometown of that mischievous sex mad lunatic Neil Cassidy, aka Dean Moriarty. There's a famous quote in this book, perhaps the most famous quote, I love it, where Kerouac describes people like Cassidy. The only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time, the ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, 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 like fabulous yellow Roman candles, exploding like spiders across the stars, and in the middle you see the blue centre light pop, and everybody goes, ah. Oh. In fact, it was Neil Cassidy, not Kerouac, who became one of my early heroes, along with the likes of Oscar Wilde and Morrissey, and oddly, Alan Bennett. Kerouac recorded an artefact of beauty and Neil Cassidy momentarily, unselfconsciously, was it, lived it. It was thrilling to me. People that live like that, that you know, sort of jitter and twitch their way through an excitable life. We're over halfway now, and it strikes me that we've not yet met the right sort of people. When Kerouac was on the road, he was off an impoverished, brassic, not hanging around with millionaires and tennis players like we've been. Kerouac thought hobos, hustlers and the homeless had a great insight into life, and I relate to that idea a bit. Remember when I'd like, been on the tube, when the preachers get on the tube and start sort of ranting and raving from the Bible, and I was quite into them, and I like, was listening to this person sort of preaching. Like, sort of, like the woman opposite me looked at me and rolled her eyes. I thought, I've got more in common with him than I have you. <laughs> I sort of thought, like, you know, sort of, I, I think that they're all right. I'm into them coming on a train preaching. Hello. Dude, are you Matt? I'm Russell. Hello. 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 I'm Debbie. Hey, Debbie. Hi, Debbie. This, is, this is my husband, Jeff. You're Jeff. married. That's good. That must make it a bit easier. The Debbie. Sex is good. The sex is good. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's a certain romance <laughs> to that. Fucking hell. See, I was born like that. Oh, really? <laughs> there's this book. It's called On the Road. In this book, Jack Kerouac often romanticizes homeless people that he meets, right. i.e. if you ain't got nothing, you're closer to God because you're not living in a material yeah, world. Right. That is probably right. easier to say yeah, if, yeah. like me, you have got a house. If you're a cripple, you have nothing, we're more richer than the rich. That's what it means. We're richer than anybody on earth. We have God who's on our side. We have people that love us out here. We stick together. We're all stick together out here. We stick together, we fight together, we get drunk together. So we're people. Like we're not animals. I appreciate that. Mm. 
love his hair. He's a fine fox. <laughs> do you think I'm a fine fox? <laughs> yes, I do. What's your name? My name is yeah, Sandra. Lovely to meet you, Sandra. Hey, you've got a very beautiful face. <laughs> Let's get you more money. I'm 60. You're 60. Delicious money. Money. Thank you. Got me with all of you. Don't waste it on drugs. Does anyone want this book? Yeah. Read it. Yeah. 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 See you, mate. Sandra, stop being passionate. Hey, you know, I'm candy? the guy that handles this yeah. corner for the city of Denver. Oh, yeah. And, can you buy me some and I'm really happy, but day. she does crack. And you're Who supporting does? the crack addicts, okay? Yeah, yeah. but people are, if Listen, people are crack addicts, they're crack addicts. What I'm are you going to do? I'm the man, okay? Well, you're a man. No, no I'm the man. Oh, so I'm staying crack. in my corner. Just go back to England, okay? You go, go, what, what do you know? You don't know nothing no, about I, us. What do you think? What do you think? We, we, I ain't just appeared now. I've lived a life up till now. No shit. You're not making it easier for him. Do you understand? I think if they get through today, that's making it easier. Take it easy. Peace. Good luck. Yeah. See you. It makes me angry, his righteousness. Right, he goes, this is my corner. I run this corner. It's going to well. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's fucking owners. Get some flowers in, mate. <laughs> yeah. That big oaf social worker from the council spoke to me like I had no idea about drugs and alcohol, but I do have an idea because I used to be on them all day long, every day. Thankfully, I managed to get my addictions under control and have never endured anything as extreme as having to be all poor and homeless and having a big oaf social worker who can't run his corner properly. Well, the reason I stopped taking drugs was the lack of alternative, really. Got, I got sacked from all of my work because I was, eight, I was un unable to function and sustain my life. I just thought he was going to die because on heroin and uh, his eyes would just roll up to white and he'd like stop talking, fall asleep in the middle of a sentence and stuff like that. But, you know, I just didn't think there were options up until then. Just thought, how else are you going to get through life? How else? Can you? Why wouldn't you take drugs? You know, that it just seemed like it wasn't like a decision to take drugs. It was just an absence of an alternative. Nowadays, I'm as sharp as a thistle and as clean as a whistle, but I still have to observe certain rituals. How was AA? AA, you say? Good. As we've gone across America, he's been to AA, obviously, in different cities, and I think it brings him back down to earth. He's sat in that room. He's not a celebrity. He's not, you know, he's no better than anyone else there. Yeah, you do get to see the... beneath the surface, I suppose. It's absurd that I'm listening to this bloke yeah. from Salt Lake City. You must get to know the place you're in so much better than you would, or at least on a different level. He finds it massively useful. I mean, I take the piss out of him and call it Mona's Club, and uh, when he shares, I can imagine he sort of stands up and performs and does a sort of bit of stand-up and everyone claps. I've been stuck in a car with that sarcastic nit for days now, so it feels good to get out of the motor and into the radio station. Digital, Russell Brand. We just met a load of homeless chums hanging out in Denver. Like, them homeless, they was nice folk and birds. But what I liked most was that old black lady. I like the way that she got all passionate. She'd go, oh my God, we got each other. We've got each other, but man, what's wrong with people today? You see, yeah. we're all together out here. Then we dished out a load of money, like Willy Wonka's. It's really good fun, actually, that bit. Patronising. What are you going to do? You know, give them money or not give them money? I'm sure they'd rather have the money. Then, this bloke have leaned in the window, sort of crane and goes, this is my corner. You've given those people money, they're going to go and buy a crack. They're crack addicts. She does crack. And you're Who supporting does? the crack addicts, OK? No. You haven't helped them, you've made them take drugs. Well, I think they needed the drugs anyway. They're living in the bloody streets. That's not, you know, what are you going to do? I can't get no... We've been driving for ages now and it's a miracle that we're still alive with Matt's treacherous driving. Now, my drive has got us across America. Once I drove for about seven hours straight yeah. and then uh, like eight hours straight. Oh, big what deal. How long have you driven? I can't drive. So you just sit there. You're, like, Russell was in charge of air conditioning uh, yep. and iPod. Yep, always nice and cool in that car. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this is... 
It's like I'm driving a tit around. <laughs> That's why I remember tit delivery man. God bless you, Ken Shack. <laughs> Hello, what's the what town are we in today? Well, here's your tit. <laughs> Sixteen hundred miles have been traversed. The rest of our journey will take us across the vast salt flats of Utah, through the deserts of Nevada and into California. Ultimately, though, we're heading to San Francisco. We sat tight and bent our minds to the goal. As we crossed the Colorado-Utah border, I saw God in the sky in the form of huge sun-burning clouds above the desert that seemed to say to me, the day of wrath will come. I feel a bit cocooned in the old jalopy. Kerouac in his time used to hitchhike a lot. We're not allowed to because of the law. But we can sure as hell pick up hitchhikers from the side of the road. Look at this pair of lovable twits. Hello, do you want a lift? We're going, Eric. We're going to, all right mate, I'm Russell, I'm from London. You're aware of Jack Kerouac? He wrote a book called On the Road, right? Yeah. It's about um, people travelling across America and discovering America. That's cool, that's Russell. cool. How come you're hitchhiking? things that hitchhiking that you won't ever see any other way. <laughs> a couple guys, Vietnam vets, picked us up last night and took us out partying. Hey, Corey! One sunny morning, we'll rise, I know. Where are you from? I was raised in Texas. And I'll meet you farther on, up the road. Left home when I was 14, started traveling with the carnival. And really? Been pretty much on the road ever since. To be honest, if I knew what I was looking for, I'd be headed right for it. What is it? Why do you think you keep traveling? I just can't seem to settle down yet, you know. It's... Have you never wanted to get married and settle down and have a family? Actually, I've been married twice. Right. I have six kids. Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> ah, to be young, free and single. The carefree life of a man with two wives and six kids there. That's where we're going to be getting off at. Take care. Hold on now. We will. Off they go, look, travelling the road and irresponsibly siring children. Now I've been out in the desert Just doing my time Searching through the dust Looking for a sign If there's a light up ahead Well, brother, I don't know but I got this fever burning in my soul. It's like the Holy Land, isn't it? It does, isn't it? Oh. This is fucking berserk landscape. Yeah, this is salt, isn't it? Fuck yeah. It's pretty biblical. It's no wonder they started up, with, you know, getting all Mormon about everything. I think that somehow inherent within travelling large geographical distances is the idea of spiritual progression, that if you travel a long way, it's kind of conducive to reflection. I suppose because of the obvious metaphor of that we're born, we die, you know, so that it's difficult not to reflect on that journey. There have been times on this incredible journey where the beauty of the landscape and the joy of encountering new people has been transcendental in its potency. Never been anywhere like this. No, me neither. It's like driving on the sea. And here, fleetingly, in this bizarre scenery, I think I can feel a bit of the sense of spiritual bliss that Kerouac was always harping on about. This is about the amount of salt I take with everything you say. <laughs> Listen, your voice echoes. Woo! I'm addicted to fame. I'm addicted to fame. This is the perfect place to learn to drive. Yeah, you should have a go at driving, because it's easy. What possibly could go wrong in this lovely salt space scape? Beep, beep! The toad hole! Yeah, don't do any hard braking, don't do that. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's too, you're turning too tight, mate, you're turning too tight. <laughs> Fucking hell. Fucking hell, Russell. That's the shit. They don't accelerate. <laughs> You know, thinking on my feet. Fucking hell, I don't want to let you have a go. <laughs> Slow down. Hit him. 
Oh, put the brake on now. You've been a very naughty girl. What's your name, mate? Greg Anderson. Greg Anderson? Yeah. We're on a road trip. So am I. What are you looking for? I just want to see this country on this motorcycle. It's amazing, but isn't it's, it? There's just no lines, you can just go. Yeah, there's no parameters, no boundaries. That's scary for a lot of people, Greg, but not for people like me and you. Now get out there, Greg, and experience that white void. Get out there. Live, man! When you see two guys on a motorcycle, the guy in the back is riding bitch. I'm riding bitch! <laughs> <laughs> That's been pretty much how it's been. You're riding bitch on an American motorcycle. <laughs> Can you <laughs> stop saying that, Greg Anderson? <laughs> He likes to ride his Harley. He says I ride bitch back. He said that I'm a sort of wife to my friend Matt. <laughs> The car was swaying as Dean and I both swayed to the rhythm and the it of our final excited joy in talking and living to the blank tranced end of all innumerable riotous angelic particulars that had been lurking in our souls all our lives. The point being that we know what it is and we know time and we know that everything is really fine. This whole experience has made me want to live more truthfully. It's made me want to sort of put aside live, like, you know, living a, a sort of a spiritual hand to mouth impoverished existence and to focus on the things that are, are absolute and constant. Hell, mate, it's a bit mad having all them stuffed animals in here after seeing the film Psycho. You run a motel and you've got stuffed animals like in the film. There's a lot of hunting around here. Let's go. Oh no. Joe, is this a trick? Is this the bit where you dress up as your mum and kill us? Oh my god. We're staying in Winniemucker. I would call it a one horse town, but if there was a horse here, Joe would probably stuff it. I think we're gonna like it here. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> Joe. My mum made mistakes with me. <laughs> <laughs> Go over there and just my pants and boots. And salute. <laughs> I'll give you a hundred dollars if you do that. You're on! <laughs> Today we've entered California and San Francisco is tantalizingly close. Jackie Kerouac's peanut butter. It's full of grim death goodness. I don't know how Kerouac managed seven years on the road. I've done three weeks and look, I'm going all insane in the membrane. Now I think we can use this door to clatter right into these little orange guys. It's the idea of the day. <laughs> Russell, don't do that. Damn you! The wind cannot stop us now! <laughs> you burk. You fucking opened your door like a knob to knock over a traffic cone, which I said we wouldn't be able to get anyway. And then the book fell out with all your notes. Thank God our journey was almost done. I've scoffed all the Kerouacki bar. My copy of On the Road lies behind us on a Californian roadside, unnoticed and unmourned. The unknown soldier of the literary world. This isn't the Golden Gate Bridge. Golden. It is golden, it is great. Yes, it is. Look, look. It's a shit bridge just coming in. What do you mean it's just a shit bridge? We've driven more than 3,000 miles in our truck all the way across America. And here we bloody well are at the Pacific Ocean. Well, hey, we reached the sea. At last. Oh, God, from our childhood endeavours. Well, 
now this is a little bit more like it on the Golden Gate Bridge front, isn't it? Wow. We saw stretched out ahead of us the fabulous white city of San Francisco on her 11 mystic hills with a blue Pacific and its advancing wall of potato patch fog beyond and smoke and goldenness in the late afternoon of time. We can't go any further because there ain't no more land. Finishing in San Francisco, where a whole generation took Kerouac's book to heart. But as bombed out beatniks and hippies mimicked Cassidy's hedonism, Kerouac worried that his spiritual message had been lost. In the end, Kerouac retreated from life and succumbed to the booze, dying, tragically, of alcoholism aged just 47. As a last tribute, I've arranged the night to talk about my life on the road. Kerouac and his mates used to hold what they called blabbermouth nights, where they'd get up and rap about their work and that man be bop be bop bop. I'd like to welcome you to the Beat Museum. Thanks a lot for coming tonight. So this is my version of a blabbermouth night here at San Francisco's fittingly shabby Beat Museum. Hello, thanks for coming. You're a drifter. <laughs> I've seen characters like you in the movies. <laughs> we started off. Here, Lowell, Massachusetts. I'll tell you one thing, a lot of my prejudices about America were undermined and dismantled because I see now that you're not the ignorant people uh, that, <laughs> that you're portrayed as by European media. The people that I actually met, gracious sort of people, people you think, yeah, they would make an apple pie for Huckleberry Finn. <laughs> there weren't much warmongering going on where I saw people. No one once mongered for a war. I didn't see no mongering. I didn't see, no one looked like they were suppressing a monger. Either. They didn't look like, hold on, there's people from Europe here, don't munger. <laughs> then the minute we go, munger, munger! <laughs> so I've learned loads and loads of things. Like a lot of us here, probably you, the drifter, me, for example, you better tell from my ridiculous haircut. What we have idealised about him and idolised is what he represents counterculturally, a sort of an icon for change. Like there is a way of living where we ain't all shackled by fear. You know they're always on about it. Oh, we're trying to find it. Well, what the bloody hell is it? And uh, here's, you know, my two penneth. That's about not being oppressed by time, not being oppressed by the idea of the journey that life begins here and ends over here. So you grant yourself a little bit of freedom in the moment that you allow yourself the privilege of spontaneity. The main thing I've got from this journey is that if you aren't governed by fear, you can live truthfully and you can find a kind of beauty. But if you're inhibited and fearful, you will live a prescriptive existence. But like, once you sort of get beyond the hedonistic first impulse of that philosophy, you find that you need to focus on something wider, more permanent and beautiful and valuable. That's what I've learned. And I kind of think, I want to do something worthwhile. Kevin and Stacey have their first lover's tiff. There's comedy on BBC Three now. 